It's a great honor to present this work on uh, resonance chains here in front of this audience. And um, a great part is joint work with Sonja Berghofen and with Frederik Faur. And um, I'm in the lucky position that we already had several talks about resonance chains, uh, or about resonances on Schottky surfaces. So I can, I think I can rather quickly go through the definitions. So we've seen several times that Schottky surfaces can be obtained from the upper half plane. We have um, SL2R acting on the upper half plane via isometries by Möbius transformations. And then we can define Schottky surfaces, or let's say we can define Schottky groups um, in the following way. Uh, we heard that Schottky groups can always be described by a so-called Schottky marking, which is simply some configuration of um, disks in the complex plane. And once, once such a configuration of disks um, is fixed, this configuration um, defines in a unique way a finite number of um, isometries, SI, that maps these circles onto each other. And, um, well, a Schottky group is then simply the group generated by these uh, isometries S1 to SR, and this gives a free discrete subgroup of SL2R. And uh, if we take the quotient of the upper half plane by this discrete subgroup, we get convex co-compact surfaces, so surfaces without funnels, uh, without cusps, and with only a finite number of funnels. And uh, the most important example of such a surface throughout this talk will be this free funneled surface, which is in some sense uh, the simplest non-trivial example in the sense of uh, scattering theory. Um, resonances, we also seen them a lot of times, are simply the poles of uh, meromorphic continuation of the resolvent. And, well, I will speak on resonance chains, and um, you already seen them quite a lot of time throughout this conference. So this is a picture taken from the first publication of uh, David Borfik, where he was doing these ex uh, numerical experiments on this resonance structure. And, well, as we have seen them already quite some time, it's maybe not surprising anymore if, you show, if I show this, you this picture, but I think when David uh, first discovered these uh, chain structures, this was still a surprise because um, remember from the talk of Peter Perry um, yesterday morning, he explained us that scattering on, on these Schottky surfaces is a model of for chaotic scattering. And I think one would have rather expected that also the resonances of such a chaotic scattering systems are more or less chaotically distributed in a certain region. But, uh, well, as this picture shows for 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 many examples, this is not the case, but we have really this, this strong structure. These resonances are really aligned on some, some curves. And when we saw this paper of David on the archive, we became quite interested, or this was quite a huge motivation for us to understand this better, because we already knew similar structures from physics literature. So, and even though I won't go into details with these examples, I still want to mention them. For example, here in the upper part, you see the quantum resonances of a free disk system. Um, so in, in mathematical terms, this is obstacle scattering in two dimensions uh, with respect to free hard um, disks in these two dimensional planes. And also here you see that these uh, quantum resonances, they build these oscillating chains. Then Secondly, this phenomenon of resonance chains is not a phenomenon of the Laplace operator. It's not a phenomenon of quantum resonances here below. This is also a picture from physics literature from Gaspar Ramirez in the 90s, where they calculated numerically the classical resonances, the real resonances, also for this free disk system, and you also see a strong chain structure. And even in physical examples, which are interesting for applications, um, some of these structures appear, so this is an a uh, uh, picture taken out of an article of mine and Wirsig, and they calculate the resonances of so-called microdisc cavities. And these cavities are important because you can buy, build uh, tiny lasers out of them. And if you want to uh, uh, construct this or tailor these lasers appropriately, you need to understand the resonance structure, and this is why they calculate it. And well, here the, the structure is less clear, but nevertheless here in these parts you see some 
some forms which very much resemble these other lines and which, well, quite seem similar. So, um, throughout this talk I will not talk about these physical examples because the problem is there that um, the tools which we need um, in order to understand these this resonance chains are from a mathematical point of view not well established. So, uh, physicists do some assumptions and uh, if we believe them we can also understand these chains but from a mathematical point of view this is not, not, not often not really sound. So I will only talk about um, the Schottky surface case and already there the, the, the phenomenon is quite rich. So this is an example of a free final Schottky surface. You've seen this. This is an example where you do not even see these individual resonances anymore because they are so densely aligned along these chains that they appear as uh, continuous lines in this plot. Well, the next picture is also the resonance structure of a free final Schottky surface but with another choice of parameters and I think you won't see any chains at all. And well, this is yet another free final Schottky surface and here, well, I can ask the question, do you see chains and if you see chains, which one do you see? So, because when we looked first at, uh, I, when I looked first at this picture with, uh, with Sonia, um, I said, oh, you know, I see chains like this. Uh, here, very straight chains parallel to the imaginary axis and Sonia, no, 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 the chains, they are, so I saw these chains and she said, no, the chains, look, they go like this. So there seems, there seem even to be examples with disambiguities. And well, what kinds of questions do I want to address uh, in this talk? So what would one like to understand? Surely on which surfaces do we see chains and on which won't we see them? And is there some mechanism which creates these chains? Well, as you might guess from the last example which I've given you, this is from a mathematical point of view a little bit an ill-posed question. Because um, uh, the question whether we see these chains and which kind of chains we see, it, this, it depends on the observer. So we cannot expect to prove a theorem here. But nevertheless, we will, uh, I will uh, formulate some pre precise hypotheses which we can test with uh, numerical experiments. Um, the second question is more, a more precise one. If one looks at, looks at these examples, one would like to write down some formulas for these, for these lines on which the resonances lie. And this is the second question I will talk about, and basically I will summarize results from these two um, publications. So, um, well, I want to collect some tools which I will need to understand these chains, and again, all these tools already appeared several times throughout other talks. So first of all, uh, the Silberg zeta function, uh, given a Schottky surface X, I denote by PX the primitive um, periodic geodesics, and then I can build this double product. Uh, we've seen this product over the geodesics, product over the positive integers, and then uh, here are the lengths of this geodesics, depends on a complex parameter S, and for a real part of S this is absolutely convergent but it can really um, continue analytically to the whole complex plane and I think originally, to my knowledge, this is a result of DOP. And, um, well, why is, well, this way we obtain a holomorphic function. And why is this holomorphic function useful to study resonances? This is the patterson perry correspondence, so, which says that um, a value S is a zero of the Selberg zeta function if and only if S is either resonance or S is a topological zero, but this can only occur at, at negative integers. And um, well, now instead of studying resonances as poles of a meromorphic continuation of, of a resolvent operator, um, we can study uh, resonances as zeros of a holomorphic function, which is technically a little bit easier. And a last tool um, which I need is the transfer operator approach or the dynamical zeta function for these Schottky surfaces. Um, we've also seen them, seen their definition in several talks of uh, Peter Perry or also this morning of uh, Martin Olbricht. Um, using the generators of the Schottky surface, we can write down some um, transfer operators that, which depend on a complex parameter and choosing the right function spaces we can obtain an analytic family of trace class operators LS, so we can build a threat determinant, and this way we obtain 
um, uh, a function in two complex variables, S and Z, which is an uh, analytic function in two complex variables. And then, what, why is this useful? Because using a trace formula for these uh, uh, transfer operators, we can uh, rewrite this determinant as the following double product. And now, if you compare this expression with this expression here, you see it's nearly the same. And in particular, if Z equals 1, then we have exactly the same expression. So the dynamical zeta function at S, comma 1, is exactly the Silberg zeta function. So um, we have thus two objects and with which have a spectrum. So on the one hand side, we have um, the resonance spectrum on the surface. So I draw here a complex plane. Um, here, my resonances of my Schottky surface live in, and they form such a resonance chain. And then, on the other side, I have another object. Um, I have the transfer operator, but as this is a trace class operator, it also has a spectrum. And uh, uh, the spectrum, I will draw it in this complex plane. So now, how are they related? Well, by this Patterson Perry correspondence, um, if I take a value s out of the set of resonances, well, so if I put my value s here on one of these resonances, well, then I know that the zeta function um, at this point s vanishes, yeah? but then I know also because the zeta function of s, this is nothing but determinant of 1 minus um, ls, that this vanishes. And well, this implies that 1 is an eigenvalue of uh, my transfer operator ls. So I have here at 1 an eigenvalue of this transfer operator. Yeah? So this is the simple relation between these two objects. And now what happens if I move this parameter s a little bit? Well, if I move it, I'm not on a resonance anymore, so Silberg's zeta function will not vanish. So 1 can't be an eigenvalue anymore. But this eigenvalue has, has to go somewhere. Yeah? And then it was uh, a Frederick Cidé idea who said, well, probably if we move this parameter s here along the line, this eigenvalue, it will start to turn. It will turn around 0, and it will come back to 1. And if it's back to 1, it creates another resonance. And if we follow it anymore, it, it's, it's only one eigenvalue that turns, and which creates all resonances along one of these chains. And um, OK, we thought this is uh, an idea which we should test. And um, the first. Uh, model where we tested this was um, the free disk system case, because there we already had at this time uh, the numerics available. Um, so um, the problem with the free disk system is that there is not uh, a, a really a, a proven patterson perry correspondence. So, we, so it's not clear whether there is a zeta function such that uh, quantum resonances are zeros of it. And well, it, it is even so clear that this, is not ex this cannot be exactly true. Nevertheless, physics, physicists had observed that they can write down some zeta function, which is called goods willers -Voros zeta function. And one observes that the quantum resonances, they coincide in a very, very good precision to these zeros of this goods willers -Voros zeta function. And um, if we accept all this, then we have exactly the same tools. We have on the left side uh, the resonance spectrum, the quantum resonances, and then we have goodswiller voros zeta function. We can write it with such a transfer operator, and on the right, you see um, uh, the spectrum of this transfer operator, Ls. And now here, this yellow point is the value of s, and if I start now the animation, this uh, yellow point will follow the line here, and here on the right side, you will see how the sp spectrum of the transfer operator be behaves. So um, I have to start this. And you see the yellow point uh, moves here along. And here on the right side, you really see the eigenvalue turns on the unit circle. And um, every time it crosses one, it creates another resonance on, on the chain. 
So, well, this worked very well for the 3D system. So we, we were sure this also will work um, on Schottky surfaces. So here we are in the case of Schottky surfaces. Here you see the, this very, very straight resonance chain. Here the red point indicates the value of S. And here on the left side you see the spectrum of this uh, bone series transfer, oper transfer operator. And again, I can start this animation and uh, this red point here will start to move. The spectrum starts to turn. But if you followed uh, the resonance closely, yeah, then it, 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 it went into the interior. And it was another resonance that came out. So um, let's have another look. So here now, it's this resonance, and if you follow it, um, it goes into the anterior, interior, and it's another resonance that creates the next, um, the next uh, resonance on, on, on my chain. And, well, this uh, shocked us at the first moment a little bit because uh, it worked so fine for the free disk system, and here it didn't work. Well, how can we explain this? The, the reason is, of course, we can write a Selberg zeta function as determinant 1 minus a transfer operator. But this way of writing it is in no way unique. So you could imagine different transfer operators here instead of this LS. And apparently, the bones series transfer operator is not the right one um, in order to understand the resonance chains. So why is it not the right one? Um, morally, such a transfer operator, which appears here, corresponds to a Poincaré section of the geodesic flow on the, on the surface. And the, uh, numerics which I've shown you were done for the completely symmetric surface, so all these lengths here were equal. However, the Poincaré section of the bowing series map corresponds to a cut here and another cut here. And you see that these cuts, they, they add some artificial asymmetry to the problem, which is not there on the surface. So in order to have a good transfer operator, one, would, one should probably change this this, uh, this Poincaré section, and then uh, one would really observe that it's one eigenvalue that turns around zero. But well, the problem with this approach is that, okay, then you have a Poincaré section for the completely symmetric surface, but you, we also want to understand other cases, so with other uh, ratios between these funnel lengths. And then we would really, for each case, have to reconstruct such a Poincaré section and so on, and this would be really hard work. So instead what we did, we chose a little bit a more flexible approach. Um, because if you look again at this dynamical zeta function, so this is again now here the transfer operator of the Bowen series map. And if you write it as this double product, and if you, if you uh, think about where the choice of the Poincaré section enters in this double product, then it is only here. In this, in this, in this number, this is n Bowen series of gummy, this is I call it the, order, the Bowen series order function of the geodesic gamma, and it precisely counts how often does a geodesic cut one of these lines. So this would be of order two, or of order one. It cuts one times this, uh, this, 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 uh, this line here. This is of order two, and this is again of order one. Yeah? So we said, okay, instead of working with a different Poincaré section, we can really start from this product and simply replace this this function here. And we say, okay, what do we need? We need some application which takes a primitive geodesic and associates a positive uh, integer. And such a function, we call it an order function on the, on the, on the primitive uh, geodesics. And then we simply write, can write down this double product. Yeah? Well, of course, one has to show that this converges and then this can be analytically continued. This can be done for all cases where we need them, and I will um, uh, explain you in the end of the talk a little bit how to do it. So for the moment, suppose that given such an order function on the uh, set of primitive geodesics, we have such a uh, generalized zeta function, then we want to have something that replaces the spectrum of the transfer operator. So how can the spectrum of the transfer operator be um, written in terms of the dynamical zeta function. It's simply the set value such that ds of 1 over z vanishes. Yeah? Uh, this is simply the spectrum of this operator. And well, of course, we can write this set 
uh, for a generalized zeta function. Yeah, it's, uh, we just say the generalized spectrum, by definition, it's the set of, of all set values such that the generalized zeta function at s and 1 over z vanishes. Yeah? And in, in this way, we, we have a very flexible way to, to, to um, define such a generalized spectrum. And now, if you choose the right order function n for this completely symmetric um, surface, then um, you obtain this. Now wait, I think it's here. Yeah. Um, you obtain this animation. So again, here it's the same surface, it's the same resonances. But here on the left-hand side, it's now not the eigenvalues of uh, the bone series transfer operators, but it's this generalized spectrum uh, with respect to a good choice of such an order function. And now if I start uh, this, it really does what we expect. It is one eigenvalue one generalized eigenvalue which turns here on the unit circle and which creates all this resonance chain. Um, well, now I was always talking about uh, the right choice of an order function. Um, and I think now I have to explain to you what this right choice is. And well, David already showed this picture this morning. This is the length spectrum of my surface which I considered. It's the surface which has all funnel lengths equal to 12. And you see this very strong clustering here at 12, 24, and so on. And well, this clustering is not exact. So it's th this is a histogram. So I put several lengths into one bin. If you see, zoom in strongly, for example, here at 60, you see that there are lengths of, there are geodesics of different lengths, uh, but you know, they are very, very close together. It's 60 and 60.02. Yeah. So this clustering is not exact, but it's very, very, um, it's approximately exact. And well, if you see such a clustering, I think it's no question how to associate uh, uh, positive integers to the geodesics. So all geodesics here, you associate to one, this is two, three, and so on. Yeah. And what you obtain is an, an order function n, which to very good accuracy um, uh, satisfies this equality. So 12, some base length times the order function gives to a very good approximation uh, the length of the geodesic. Yeah? And, well, and, and for, the, for the symmetric case, this is, this is the right choice here. So can we learn something from this? So for example, we have seen this uh, surface where there was no, uh, no chains at all. Um, and well, if we look at the length spectrum, it looks like this, and we don't see any clusters. So with such a length spectrum, you can't choose a good order function, yeah, which approximates, the, which has this approximate uh, uh, equation here. So, and apparently if you don't have a clustering, if you can't choose such a good order function, then you won't also see um, any chains. And well, with this approach, you can also understand um, these, these ambiguities here by simply taking two different ways of uh, clustering, but I will skip uh, the videos for this because I want to uh, show some new pictures in the end. Um, if you want to see them later on in the coffee break or so, I have them on, on my laptop. So let me come to a first summary of this third, first experimental um, um, part of the talk. So what we've seen is that the resonance chains, they are related to a clustering in the length spectrum. And this means that there exists a base length L and an order function on the primitive geodesic such that the length of the geodesic is um, well approximated by N times this base length. And if you look at different surfaces, you, always, uh, you also um, see that the better this condition is fulfilled, the clearer and the more exact these, um, these resonance uh, chains become. Um, you can also learn that um, 2 pi over L is the distance of the resonances along these chains because this is simply the speed with which the eigenvalue turns around zero. And well, we also observed uh, in this animation another thing. So the eigenvalue does not only turn around zero, it turns exactly on the unit circle if I follow the, the continuous line suggested by these discrete points. And this means that, well, if I take the zero set of this uh, dynamical zeta function, and if I take the set um, with set absolute value of z equals to one, 
then this gives some uh, analytic variety in, in C2. And if I project this down to the S part, I get some continuous line in the complex plane. And apparently these lines are, are just the lines given by, uh, uh, the, given by the visual expression of these discrete points on which they lie. And well, okay, in some sense, we could say that this is some kind of formula for these resonance chains, but of course this is a very implicit formula because it involves this zero set of a generalized theta function. What I, I really wanted to have when I was talking about formula for these chains is a simple formula which you can really calculate. And um, this simple formula can then not be true exactly anymore for a given surface. Uh, but uh, we hope that we can show something in a certain limit um, such that these, these, these formulas become exact in a, in, a, in a specific limit. And I will talk about this uh, for the second part of my talk. And let me first um, explain you what kinds of limits we have to consider. So um, we will only deal with free funneled uh, surfaces so far. And the space of all free funneled surfaces up to isometries um, which is the modular space or Teichmiller space. For these surfaces, it's quite simple. It's just uh, parameterized by three positive um, real numbers. And these three positive real numbers, they have a very uh, precise geometrical meaning. They are exactly the lengths of these three geodesics here, which are closed and which uh, circle once around each of these funnels. And um, well, given such three parameters, L1, L2, and L3, I will denote by x, l1, l2, l3, um, the corresponding Schottky surface. And now, from the first part of, to of the talk, we've learned that um, the better this clustering of the length spectrum is, the, the more accurate these resonance chains do become. So what we should like look at is some limit in which this length clustering becomes exact. And if you look at the following uh, family of surfaces, so if you fix three positive integers, n1, n2, n in three. And if we take um, a positive um, parameter L, which we can let go towards infinity, and if you then look at the surface x, n1, L, n2, L, and n3, L, then we obtain a family of surfaces. And well, geometrically, this means that we fix the ratio of, these, of the lengths of these three funnels. And we let the lengths go towards infinity, but we keep the ratio of these three lengths fixed. Yeah? So this is the limit which we, are, which, which we consider. And if you consider such a family and look at the length spectrum, then you observe that the clustering becomes, in this limit, becomes exact. Yeah? So from what we learned in the first part of the talk, this is a, is a promising limit to, uh, to make these uh, chains exact. And um, well, we can look at the numerics again. So I fixed here the, ra the ratio to be 4, 4, and 5. And my parameter L here on this plot is 3 and 4. So the blue uh, crosses is L equals to 3, and the red ones is L equals to 4. And what you see is that these two plots, they look quite different, yeah? um, at least in the position. But if we have a closer look, then we see that the overall structure is still quite similar. So if we start here with high real parts, then we see for the blue uh, resonances one single chain here. And also the red ones start with a single chain. Then for the blues, we have well, one chain that splits up. And also for the red ones, next we have a chain that splits up, another blue chain that splits into two, another red chain, and so on. So the overall structure is similar. However, you see that the red resonances, they are much closer at zero. Yeah? And this becomes worse and worse if you make L go towards infinity because you make the system more and more open. So the Hausdorff dimension, delta, converges to zero and this is the first resonance. Yeah? So the only thing what you observe in this limit if you consider the resonances is that everything shrinks towards zero. And this is of course a little bit a boring limit. So in order to observe something interesting in this limit, we have to get rid of this shrinking towards zero and what we can do is um, we can rescale the resonances. Um, what we can do is simply multiply them by L. And if we do this, we end up with this picture. So now you see that L equals 3 and 4 look very similar. Here on the first line, you barely see any 
any difference between the red and the blue crosses. Um, here you start to see some differences, and here for the last chain here, the differences are quite are still quite quite severe. But okay, three and four is not yet infinity. Yeah, if you go to higher L values, then this also will converge. So well, the numeric suggests that this is an appropriate limit if you look at the rescaled resonances, and um, well, this can not only be observed in the numerics, but this can really uh, rigorously be shown. So in order to prove this, I need a slight assumption here. The assumption is that the sum of two of the int integers is always bigger than the third one. So these three integers, they have to um, be able to form a triangle. Yeah, so, but once this is so fulfilled, um, I can write down a polynomial, which, well, it looks a little bit lengthy, but it's just a simple polynomial which is very explicitly given by this, by these three integers, n1, n2, and n3. And, and then the theorem says the following. We can fix an arbitrary number of, of rescaled resonances. And in the limit L towards infinity, these rescaled resonances uniformly converge to the zeros of the polynomial evaluated in e to the minus s. So you get, take the polynomial, plug in e to the minus s, and look for the zeros of this polynomial. And, um, and these are uh, the, the positions of the resonances in this geometric limit. Well, um, I will say something about the proof in a second, but first let us check this in the numeric. So it's again the same plot. Uh, I fix the ratio to 4, 4, and 5. Um, L equal to 3 and L equal to 4 is the, bla uh, the blue and the red crosses. And now I added these green circles here, and these are the zeros of the corresponding polynomial. And you see it already works quite well here. Um, there's a perfect agreement even for L equal to 3. Here we see some deviations for L equal 3, but L equal 4 is still perfectly uh, approximated by the zeros of this polynomial here as well. And only here we see some deviation for L equals to 4. Yeah, so it seems to work very well if, even for relatively uh, low L values. And um, well, now let me sketch how to how to prove this. Um, the proof consists basically of two of two parts. Uh, in the first part, we really have to show that these generalized zeta functions are in fact some analytic functions. And what is the right order function which we need to take um, for this family of surfaces? So, well, we have to take a geodesic and we have to count how often it winds around um, these three funnels here. And then, uh, um, well, we count how often it winds around the first funnel and multiply this number of by, by n1 and uh, the winding number of this, the second funnel is multiplied by n2 and so on. And, um, well, this defines the appropriate order function and we show that uh, the generalized zeta functions are, um, in fact, holomorphic functions in these two variables, s and z. And in the second step, um, we have to uh, 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 deal with this, um, this generalized, um, uh, with this risk, or with this, with this geometric limits. And as we want to study the rescaled resonances, um, we have to rescale our zeta function. So we, devise, we, we divide here uh, this zeta function, this s value by l, and then look in look this family of, of holomorphic functions and study it into the, in the limit of L towards infinity. And what we then observe is that it simply converges towards this polynomial. So this polynomial shows up as, as a limit of this generalized zeta function if we rescale it appropriate it in, in the limit L towards infinity. And yeah, well, let me tell you some details about the first step. How do we, um, how can we, um, achieve these, these uh, generalized zeta function. Um, well, the idea was to follow very closely uh, the proof how you do um, the analyticity of the, of the dynamical zeta function, except that we have to replace the bone series maps uh, by an appropriate Poincaré section. So remember this bone series map had this kind of artificial asymmetry, and uh, we simply added here another cut line, so this corresponds and I, I simply cut my, my surface into two parts, an upper part and a lower part, and I glue it together along this, um, this uh, 
colored circles here. And um, this way I get a Poincaré section and I can write down a transfer operator. But this is now only one Poincaré section for all surfaces and the order function n is simply incorporated by adding some uh, n-dependent potential which also depends on two um, complex parameters which has to be chosen appropriately and then we study the transfer operator with this potential. Uh, we have to show that it's race class but this follows really exactly the lines how you do it for, for Bowen series maps and this way we get uh, an order function, uh, we, we get a, a holomorphic function in two complex variables here which is simply the Fretholm determinant by the, of this, this transfer operator here. And um, okay, and then of course you have to check that this is really the double product using trace formulas and, and this correspondence of fixed points of our Poincaré sections with the closed geodesics, but this is some work, but it's quite straightforward really. Okay, so how do we obtain these geometric limits? Um, so we now consider a family of surfaces, which gives us a family of uh, generalized zeta functions here. And, um, well, they are given by a Fretholm determinant and such a Fretholm determinant can always be um, expanded in the so-called Grotendieck expansion, which is a, a serious expansion of, of this determinant here. And these coefficients here, they are quite explicitly determined by the nuclear representation of this transfer operator L. And then the, really the crucial point was that we uh, could use some techniques which we found in a, a nice article of Jenkinson and Polycott. And they developed uh, formulas to bound these, uh, explicit formulas to bound these coefficients. And um, they use it uh, in order to, to find errors to error terms if k goes towards infinity. But here in this setting we could use it um, to bound these terms in the limit L goes towards infinity and what, we, what, what, what one finds is that from the sixth uh, coefficient uh, or from the sixth uh, for k larger than six, this series here converges uniformly towards zero in the limits L towards infinity and here it was really the crucial point to have these, these estimates here. And well then it remains only finitely many terms in, uh, for my uh, theta function so I just have to study the first six terms here and we have to simplify them any furthermore using the trace formula um, of this transfer operator again and then one can show that uh, in fact these remaining terms they converge towards this, this uh, polynomial and this is how, 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 how I obtained this polynomial as, as this limit here of the remaining terms here. Okay, so um, let me um, summarize what we've seen in the, in, in the second part. So we've seen that the resonance chains, they become exact in the limit L towards infinity in these geometric limits, um, but we have to rescale the resonances into, in order to see something interesting at all. Um, we have seen that these polynomials, these simple polynomials, give in fact um, some some um, approximate formulas for individual position of resonances um, of the surfaces and well this formula for the individual position of resonances they are in some sense complementary to the semi-classical limit because what we have to do is we have to fix a finite number of, of resonances and we had, have to take the geometric limit for this fixed number of resonances and in semi-classical analysis what you do normally is you fix a surface and then look uh, in in the limit imaginary parts towards infinity and then let the number of resonances go towards infinity. And well, yeah, that's, that's it. So um, as some people here in the audience already have seen a very similar talk some months ago in Orléans, I thought that I should add a, at least a little bit something new and I put it into the outlook and well, maybe a little bit disappointing in this result is that this, this, this um, polynomial, it only gives the position of the chains, but then the chains are only straight lines. Yeah, but <clears throat> okay, this is what comes out if you rescale um, the resonances like this, then in, the, in this limit, um, 
uh, the chains become straight lines. But nevertheless, if you look at the, at the full resonance plot, <coughs> you also see this oscillation, these characteristic oscillations, which seem to be there and which, which are not captured by, by this limit. And, well, remember, if, if we don't rescale and let the lengths go towards infinity, then everything shrinks towards zero. If we rescale the real part and the imaginary part, so if we stretch both parts by a factor of L, then we get the straight lines. But what we could also do is we could scale the real part and the imaginary part differently. So instead of stretching both, I only stretch the real part by my parameter L, and I squeeze the imaginary part, um, and I have to squeeze it exponentially, and then one obtains these pictures. Yeah? So now, um, you see here I rescaled by L, and here I rescaled exponentially by e to the L over 2, and now uh, these resonances for these three, oh, this is a 9, I think, here, sorry. This is 7, 8, 9. Um, they lie really perfectly onto each other, and Okay, oh, I should say these calculations were done in the similarity reduction. It's only the resonances for the trivial representations which you see here. And if we write down this uh, factorized zeta function, uh, the symmetry reduced zeta function, and if we only take the first two terms of the symmetry reduced zeta function, this gives us um, uh, a formula for, straight, for, for some continuous lines. Um, and uh, you see it coincides very, very well with with what we find numerically. The only problem is um, the, thing that we, the, the fact that we rescale here implies that we need much, much stronger bounds on our, on our coefficients in the Grotendieck expansions. And so far, um, uh, so, and I think this, this requires some work, yeah? but I think probably if one is a little bit more careful as I have, I have been in, in, the, in the estimates, it's, it's likely that it's possible that one also can obtain um, why an, as an anisotropic rescaling these kind of, of limits and, but, well, I have nothing done in this direction, so, yeah, I want to end with this slide. <laughs>